Welcome to Ignite Your Confidence for women in leadership who want to speak up and stand out. I'm your host, Karen Laus. Here you'll get all of the tips and tools that you need to stand out with unshakable confidence. Let's dive into today's episode. All right. Well, Jillian, I am looking forward to hearing from you today. So as you know, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you and tell you to tell us about yourself. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Um, yeah, as soon as people find out about my previous career, they're very, very interested by it. <laughs> and it's, I often avoid talking about it for that reason, because the conversation completely shifts to me. But um, previously, I was a high stakes poker player, I played some of the high stakes in the world for more than 12 years. And I don't, yeah, I don't really know how I got into it other than I was playing a lot of poker, doing a lot of different things. I, I'm what I consider a multi-potentialite in that <laughs> I'm really good at a lot of different things, but not anything in specific. And poker worked out for me for that reason, because I was able to do a lot of different things on the sides. My main passion is traveling. And so poker allowed me to travel and have a career. And now I'm kind of like moving on from poker, trying to figure out what the next step of my life is. And it's been a hard, hard point for me because I felt like I had no skills because on a resume, all I can write is I've been a poker player for 12 years. <laughs> I can see where that would be a conundrum. And at the same time, and I love what you said, because I could see where it's, it's, you're right. It's fascinating, particularly because you see so few women in this, I mean, I personally have never met anybody and we met through Fempeak and I had no idea that you've had this whole other life. I mean, obviously it's also such a good reminder that we are all complex human beings and there's so much more to all of our stories than what people see in one situation. So that was also something that struck me about just really my own interaction in general with people. Like, what do I, where do I, what do I look at with people and how can I ex be more expansive as well? And, and my thinking anyway, I digress. That's, that's about me. So anything more that you wanted to share about, about you before I ask you questions about me? Okay. If you do like a quick summary, yeah, a multi potential, it really does encompass who I am because in school, I scored in the top percentile in every single subject on our exams. I scored in the top percentile. I went to university, I took a course in every single subject. So for me, I could just never find the perfect. It wasn't that I wasn't passionate about a bunch of things because I was passionate about everything I did, but I never had a direct path. Like I, my mom tells me as she, when she was a kid that she knew that she wanted to be a teacher from like when she was a child, she knew she wanted to be a teacher. Wow. And I've just had such a different struggle because it's not that I'm not interested in those things. I'm interested in too many things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That I, I relate to that, by the way, because when I was in college, I remember somebody that knew me from my childhood said, you got to read this book. And it was, it was a woman named Barbara Sher is the author. And it's called, I could do anything if I only knew what it was. Yeah. <laughs> I, because I, people would say, and I even had somebody look at my resume in my probably mid twenties going, I, I can't figure out what you actually want. You've done so many different things. And I found that really frustrating. And at, I mean, when I was growing up and interviewing for jobs earlier in my career, it was expected that you had some type of path. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I just remember personally too, that I knew I wanted to have a degree in psychology because I loved people and how they show up in the world but I knew I didn't want to be a therapist, but I really didn't know much beyond that. And I think what's so great is that nowadays we can have these portfolio careers and you know you can be a poker player. And you, I know you were a yoga teacher as well. I don't know if you're still doing that, but there's all these different facets to us in ways that we can make money and also serve the community in a way that really fulfills us too. So actually that brings up a good point. What do you love doing? Yeah, my passions are definitely animals and traveling. So that's why poker worked very well for me for a long time and that it did allow me to travel. And I had a lot of free time where I could spend cuddling animals and things <laughs> like that. But in terms of one path for a career, it was just everything is way too exciting to me. <laughs> Say more about that. 
<laughs> um, just everything I get into, I like dive deep into it and I wanna learn a lot about it. And then I learn about some other aspect and I'm like, okay. And like you were saying, we're this is kind of the perfect time for me to be alive because there is so many options to learn about all those different things. Like I just even remember in high school being just so overwhelmed by the pressure that my guidance counselors were putting on me. And I didn't know about all these different opportunities. Like you were saying about, you knew you, you knew you wanted to go in psychology, but you didn't want to be a counselor. Now there's so many more resources for people to find those different positions than there were even when I was in high school and the internet was newer and didn't have the amount of information that it does now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I am super curious how you got into poker. I mean, obviously I've read about you and have some idea, but can you, for those of you that those people that are listening that don't know anything about you and go, what a female professional poker player that actually has made money on it. And how did you get into it? Yeah, it is rare. Like only about 3% of the field is female. Wow. I've always loved games. Like um, I was just talking about Christmas and Christmas all year. I saved up for a Canadian game. It's called Ramoli and it was a card game. And that's what I thought about all year. I love all <laughs> card games. In fact, looking back at kids that knew me growing up, I don't think they'd be that surprised that I turned into a poker player because I was always the one on the playground that's like, oh, let's play, let's play any g- game of cards. <laughs> Um, but then I also feel like my teachers kind of expected me to like be a doctor or something, (laughs) but the kids knew that side of me of the playing games. So yeah, I tried a lot of things. Um, I started playing poker actually in India. I went to India to study yoga, started studying Buddhism under his holiness, the Dalai Lama himself. And one of the things that I learned for, through that was that that t- this type of idea that you're meant for one purpose or that you should focus all your energy wasn't for me mm. because there are some people that we do need experts in fields for sure we need people that that's all they do but we also now need people that can see how that applies to different areas and that's me like I have a really good understanding I'm not going to be the best at anything but I have a really good understanding of different topics so I was studying yoga, studying Buddhism, and I'm like, okay, this this isn't for me. Like, there's a lot of good takeaways, but I'm not going to be someone that's going to be just focused on meditating all day. <laughs> and at the end of the day, I was just playing back, poker against backpackers, and I was able to make like $150 a day, which isn't oh my a lot, gosh. <laughs> but it was enough to live in India. And that was the start of it. Then I went to China, played there. Then I came back to Canada. And I actually started working in a casino as a dealer while teaching yoga, while going to university. And eventually I just had to make a decision and poker allowed me to travel. So I chose poker. That's awesome. Well, you know, my podcast is all about confidence and I love the confidence that you have and that you're, you're such a role model in so many ways. And the more that I dug deeper into your, 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 you (laughs) online, I went, oh, this is so cool. And you are such an inspiration. So I'm curious to know, because you have so much confidence, has there been times, or is there a particular time where you weren't confident and you felt like, whether it's the imposter syndrome or you had some self-doubt, and if there's a specific example or a story, that would be really cool. Yeah, definitely. I have so many. When you said that, I was like, oh, there's so many things that <laughs> popped into to my head. Um, just even like in high school, like I had an eating disorder. I think a lot of high school oh, wow. female girls do. And I remember that that was a way I'm like, I can change my weight. I can do anything. Like I can take, take control of that. And I liked that as that element of confidence. That's how I got over that is like taking complete control. But I remember the first time I ever played poker and listening to the people around me. And then you get to a point where you're like, wait, these people are all confident, these men. I was in a room, I was the only female in the room. And I remember just li- listening to them and being like, oh yeah, I should learn from them. And I should, because I'm a beginner. But then uh, there was a point in my career where I'm like, wow, these people that are talking don't know anything. I like, I know more about them. 
<laughs> and that was a really interesting spot in my career where I was able to just be like, okay, I can I don't need to listen to this anymore. I, I can judge the stuff for myself. Oh my gosh. I love that. It's so interesting too, when you get to a certain age or a point in time in your career, or whatever it is, when you realize nobody really knows what they're doing or, yes. <laughs> or it's true everywhere, right? Like we're all kind of faking it. <laughs> I know we're all trying to figure it out. And that's so comforting. And yet, like for me, I spent way too much of my life worried about not being good enough. And I think that is such a, a female quality. I do think that men have it too, but it seems like there's just more talk about it probably because I work mostly with women. But how about a time where you were in a situation where you had no clue? I'm just, I'm thinking about kind of a time where you walked into an environment where you felt completely unsure of yourself and what you did to overcome that, or in that particular situation, did you overcome that? Yeah, I do think one of my best skills in life is my mental game and the, the, the voice in my head that is able to say, yeah, look at things objectively. It's not adding emotion to things. I think that's why I was successful as a poker player because that, that inner critic wasn't there as much. There's definitely times, especially when you know someone's going to be in poker particular, like you could be on camera and then you know everyone's going to see everything you did. <laughs> so, you, and of course with Twitter and social media, they're all going to be judging you. Right. So that does play into my play, especially in when I'm in a televised event. But I remember being in a spot at the table where in my head, I was like, oh, no one's going to know if I fold. Like no one's going to know that I did this this the, that I thought could be a really terrible fold and that, that gave me a little bit of confidence but that no one else is seeing this like only you are aware of this information but it's so scary nowadays with social media that you can think that okay everyone's going to judge me for this but they're going to judge you no matter what so it's kind That's of irrelevant <laughs> yes yes oh that is such a good point it's so true well so much of what I do is video coaching and I always laugh and say, you know, a lot of people go, oh, I don't want to watch it. I don't want to watch it. And I think everybody's seeing it anyway. Wouldn't you rather see what people are actually seeing Yeah. and then that reality? And I love that. Yeah. We can't worry about what people are going to say or how they're going to judge us. So I would love to go back for a moment and well, back for in your past, anything up beyond today, <laughs> was there a time where you made a particular mistake or had a failure that you learned from or overcame that you'd be willing to share with us? One thing, I mean, it's kind of more general than that, but it definitely took me a long time to get over that fear of what people would think of me like even on social media I wouldn't voice my opinions because I'm like who am I to -hmm. say that like Mm -hmm. that that's something I still struggle with is when am I going to say stand up for something I believe in and when am I not because you never know the entire side of the story so that's my issue with everything is Mm -hmm. when I'm trying to defend someone that I think needs defending I'm not necessarily in that environment uh, to have had all that information to make that decision that this person, that I am in the right to defend this person. (laughs) And with social media, when you do something like that, you just get torn into by other people. Um, But I have gone to the point in my life more where I don't care that much. Like I'm able to like write a tweet and then turn off Twitter and like not go back and read all the nasty comments that people are saying to me. And I really think that's just an age thing. Like, it's just, Mm -hmm. I don't even care anymore. Like I'm confident (laughs) about who I am. You can disagree with me and I honestly don't care. We can have a discussion if this is going anywhere, but if you're just going to tell me I'm wrong, I don't care what you think. (laughs) That's so inspiring. How do you get there? I know that part, like you said, age, I feel the same way. I've got to feel like I've turned the corner, but I can't necessarily pinpoint a specific event or time where things shifted how about you was there a specific time or was it just 
which has kind of evolved. It has definitely evolved, but some of my friends that are my age aren't at that level. Mm. And the thing that I'm constantly like nagging about them is when they, when they criticize themselves in any way. I'm like, Hey, don't talk about my friend that way. Like you're not allowed. <laughs> and it just, yeah. So I'm definitely at a different confidence level than some of them, even though we're at the same age. And yeah, I just don't like, you can't have those thoughts. You can't even say it out loud. You, you're not allowed to do that around me. You're not allowed to criticize yourself. Things that I, I'm, that would be inappropriate for someone to say to you, why are you saying them to yourself? Yeah, it's so true, isn't it? I, I was just at a retreat where we were paired up with people. Well, first we had to write down for two minutes, all of the negative things we say about ourselves to ourselves. And then um, they surprised us and had to switch the paper with somebody else. And they, we had to read it to the person. Like it would, um, I had to read it. Like I was saying, and the, the point was you would never talk to anybody like that. You would never let somebody talk to you like that. Why do we do that mm -hmm. to ourselves? And I think that's a really good reminder for anybody listening to remember to positively counteract those things, those negative thoughts with something positive, like have a positive affirmation at the ready for yourself. So when you do start noticing, I mean, that first step really is awareness. And I love that you are the person in your friend group to be able to make people aware of that because half the time we don't even realize we're doing it. So, so important to, to have that. I'm really curious about you in this incredibly male dominated field. I, because I, I coach a lot of women in male dominated fields, but I'm particularly curious about what challenges you faced or were there any situations? I mean, I'm sure there were, let me, let me phrase it differently. Are there any situations or stories or examples that you'd be willing to share about how you might've been treated as a woman and just so that we can relate to some of those stories? Yeah, this has been obviously a topic that I've had a lot of experience talking about, but it's also something that I've learned a lot. And the one thing that I've learned to, that's kind of like mind blowing is my experience isn't what everyone else's experience is. I can't talk for all the females in the industry. Right. Uh, understood. Understood. Yeah. I just, it took me a while to realize that because mm. often tables, oftentimes I'd be like, Oh no, I'm, I'm treating it really well. Like people, I often get added information because guys are like flirting with me or something. And they'll just, just they'll, they'll treat me better, but that's not true for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So there's positives and there's negatives. Um, a documentary that I was in, the producer of the documentary dressed as a man. And I was just like fascinated by this. And she talked about the different experiences playing as a female at the table and playing as a man. And the one thing that she said is she was invisible as a man. Now, that makes a lot of sense to me because I'm people always remember me they're, they're always coming up to me and telling me about times they've met me and stuff like that. And because I stand out. And I just thought that was just, so there's a huge advantage to standing out and there's also a huge negative to standing out. There's positives <laughs> to both sides of that. Um, it took me a while because to realize some of the sexism I faced because most of the time I was just like oh he doesn't like me or something like I don't know he's in a bad mood and I remember not too long ago it was only like three or four years ago I was playing in Texas and I came back to my room and I I was like almost in tears the entire table was just being so rude to me and I was crushing like I had just I was playing very well I had all, so much more money than the rest of the table. So I thought they were just kind of mad about that. And then I was talking about the comments that they were saying. And the person I was talking to was like, yeah, they're just like being sexist. And that never, in my mind, I did, that didn't even cross my mind. In my head, it was just like, I was taking it personal mm -hmm. and it wasn't about my gender at all. Oh, wow. So fascinating. Huh. And what did you take away from that? Yeah, I learned, that's where I was like, okay, so maybe I have, to, maybe this, this situation of me being unique and being a female in a male dominated world isn't as perfect and rosy as I thought. Maybe <laughs> there are some things that I need to acknowledge are disadvantages. Um, since then, I've been in spots where I have been treated not well. 
And then there's this ethical dilemma of if I'm making a lot of money off of this person, do I let him talk to me like this? Mm. Or do I stand up for myself? Do I stand up for, therefore, also future females that are going to come through? Like, is that my job or is my job just to take the money? Wow. I'm pondering that myself. <laughs> well, it's, I don't think it's an easy answer. It's, you yeah. can't, I think, and I think you can be both. I can think you can be selfish sometimes when you don't have the emotional strength and you can also be on your crusade at some time. Mm-hmm. It is really tough. I mean, I love that you brought up it's an ethical dilemma because I'm imagining myself in that situation and I would be pissed if somebody was talking to me a certain way. And yet it's that challenge of that whole, but that bite the hand that feeds you. But at the same time, when do you, when can you stand up? I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't know the answer myself. And I think that it probably is a judgment call for any of us that are in that situation at the given time of what to do. So what did you, or did you ever like, let's say, I love that scenario that you created earlier, or you talked about with how everybody was saying things about you and yet you were killing it on the table. Did you say anything at the time? Yeah. I remember in poker, the person that you go to is the dealer. And then the next person would be the floor. Now the dealer has their own incentive to not create a ruckus or whatever disturbed game because they get tips. So I kind of like played with the dealer. I'm like, oh, can you believe how mean they are? Like, I remember that. Like I was, I, played it, I said it in like this little childish voice. Can you believe how mean? Are, are you just going to put up with them talking to me like this? Like I acted like it wasn't a big deal. <laughs> um, I later started this open conversation on Twitter and stuff. And yeah, people were quite t- torn. There wasn't an easy answer as to whether I should have, reported this these players one of your jobs in at the table is to make everyone have a good especially as a professional because poker is so different because you're playing with amateurs and you're playing professionals there's no other sports where you're just they don't have basketball players and then just some random joe blow (laughs) is playing in the nba like the court (laughs) And why would he, right? Like, why does he want to play with people better than him? In poker, it's the same question. Like, why would someone that's losing money want to play with someone that's way better than them? And one of the reasons they keep coming back is luck, but the second is that it's fun for them. Hmm. So it's so important for me to create this good environment. And therefore, I'd often be slower to comment, especially as a winning player. But I also have that that part of me that's like okay if they're not talking to the dealer correctly or there's all the women that aren't in the industry that are not as competent as me that I should make sure have a safe place and I put a stop to this right now so that's what I'm constantly dealing with in my head wow yeah I can totally see the dilemma what do you what would happen just playing this out what would happen if you well, I mean, who knows? We could all speculate, but all, all two of us here right now. But if you did speak up to somebody and you were making a ton of money off of that person, like, can you give me a sense of how you think that scenario would play out? Um, I do remember this player that I was absolutely crushing and I was really the only one that was making money off of him, but still the rest of the table didn't want him to go. And um, it got to the point where he was being abusive to other people. And that was when I put, I went and told the, the, the person who ran the entire casino, I talked to them about it and he was just shocked. He's like, wow, he's so nice to me. But then, but then he said, you know, like, since you approached me, other dealers have approached me and stuff. And I, when I talked to them and that made me feel good that I'd done the right thing there, but he actually did get permanently banned from the property. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I did have a lot of people that were like kind of angry with me. I didn't care, <laughs> but <laughs> I did have people that were upset with me for that. Cause he feels like I'm losing money. I can treat it, it. It'd be a lot of similar situations. Like probably someone that works in a restaurant has probably experienced that where someone tips really huge and they think they can treat you any way you 
they want, right. but right. that's not the case. We still have to be civil to each other. Yeah, exactly. Well, I can remember in a corporate position, one of my first jobs as an HR manager, and there was a guy that was incredible with sales and he brought in a ton of money, but he was a total jerk to the people inside and it caused a lot of, of challenge. And I can see where the company would have a hard time of, ugh, but you know, he's making all this money and he's our main yeah. producer. But at the same time, it's just not right when you when you yeah. think, oh, well, what is the actual right thing to do? Well, let's let's go off of that for a minute. Thank you for indulging me. I mean, I think it's that's absolutely fascinating. And we all have to make our judgment calls or or whatever, decide what we're gonna do in the, our own situations. But I'd love to turn it over to thinking about mentors in your life. What would you say is the best advice that you've ever been given in general? There's been a lot, but really, this is kind of a weird one, but it's something I think about a lot is I was <laughs> once in the playing and this Asian woman turned to me, I was, I was running really badly, like I was having really bad luck. And she turned to me and she's like, the best way to change your luck is to wash your hands. Now that's super superstitious and it's like, a, I'm not superstitious at all. But the reason that advice is so important is because it causes you to walk away from the table. So whatever you're doing in life, if you're mm. in a heated argument with your spouse or something, and then instead of just continuing that, taking a second to go to the washroom and wash your hands and reevaluating your mental state just is just so beneficial for the rest of the, your life, for going forward from that moment, taking that short break. It would be the same as like taking 10 seconds to breathe or something. But this idea that, hey, I can change what's happening just by washing my hands just puts you in a different frame of mind. I love that. It's so simple, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's so good. Oh, thank you. Well, what about advice that you would offer? What would you say, thinking specifically about, let's say a woman who isn't feeling as confident as she would like, what advice would you give to her? Um, my advice would be like, why aren't you feeling confident? I think <laughs> take yourself out of it and look at yourself from someone else's perspective. And if you're evaluating your skills from someone else's perspective, should you have the confidence that you're missing? Because that's a way of really figuring out what skills you need to work on versus which is just the lack of confidence. If you're not letting the person in your head talk, but from, from a different perspective, from someone else that's just watching. You think of yourself as like, you're, you're watching this character play a movie. This, and what is the audience yelling to this character? <laughs> That's really great. What a good visual. Oh my gosh. I love that. Well, tell us, just said we're starting to wrap up here. I'd love to know what is, well, you talked a little bit about you love cuddling animals. You love traveling. Sounds like you love adventure. Probably all of those are, are wrapped in together, but what would you say on a daily basis gives you the most joy. And if, and I'd love to hear what you would have to say to that. And if you have any suggestions for anybody else, like a daily practice or a daily habit. That is such an interesting question. I mean, you kind of answered it in that I like experiences, but you're right that there has to be some kind of highs and lows in life. I remember when I was studying yoga really, really seriously, where I was doing seven sessions a week, six days a week. And I remember after a really tough session, the best feeling in the world was showering. <laughs> <laughs> and that the cold water on my body felt so great. And I often think about that, that how much joy we can get from the minor things, how much joy that shower brought me makes me really think about in my life, how I can find joy in tiny little things. Cause that felt so amazing. But in my day-to-day -day life, it, people energize me. So mm -hmm. being around friends and having new experiences and yeah, just like seeing a dog makes me smile. Aww, that's so great. Well, tell us also what other ventures you're involved in. Any Anything else or anything else that you want to share organizations or yeah, hobbies or anything else? 
that maybe yeah, you, so, yeah go ahead so Karen, Karen and I met through Femme Peak so yeah. Femme Peak actually reached out to me through Instagram and they're specifically looking for a female poker player really? they said well they said we want we one of the huge problems is we have is what your podcast address is women lack confidence and they also lack risk, risk taking and mm -hmm. they're like as a female poker player you'd have those skills in my head I'm like maybe I'm not the best person then for that because I have those skills and I don't really know why women lack them <laughs> but but it has been it's been great to get involved in this community and just learn I, I my my life before was just I was always around poker players and professional gamers in general and the way we think about the world is a lot about probabilities um uh, I what I like is that like rather than saying yes or no to things a lot of my friends will say like I'm 80 percent sure that I'm going to commit to that or mm -hmm. and that I do like that aspect of it but I'm enjoying getting to see the rest of the world, how they live. And <laughs> it's, it's, it's been a process. Um, sometimes our founder, Somi, is like, I, I'm not sure you're built up, uh, built for this days where you have like, because um, for me, I'm more, I, I, as a poker player, I made my own schedule. So now being, having to be available at a certain time is like a grown up <laughs> thing that I've never had to do before, but it, it's an interesting process. <laughs> I love it. Well, yes, that's a good point for anybody listening. Fempeak is an amazing organization with lots of benefits. So I, I encourage everybody to check that out. Well, tell us how we can reach you. Where can we find you? Anybody that's listening that would like to connect with you? Yeah, so on most po social media, Instagram and Twitter, I'm at Jillab, at G-I-L-L-E-P-P. -P. Um, on the internet, <laughs> like on my website, <laughs> I'm Jillian at my full name. But yeah, I'm pretty active on Twitter. I like Twitter, so that's my, my main platform. And other than that, I'm at all the Fan Peak events as their event manager. Awesome. Well, and I, I love your name on YouTube, Hustler Honey, is that right? That's true. That was my absolutely first screen name as a poker player. It's based on maybe some of your audience knows it. Um, my first dog's name was Honey, and it's spelled H U N N Y. That's how she spelled her name. And <laughs> um, a TV show called The Hustle, which was a BBC program that was kind of similar to Ocean's Eleven, but uh -huh. in terms of um, a TV show. So yeah, that was my first screen name. When I started my YouTube channel again and started streaming on Twitch, I brought out my first ever screen name and brought it back. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of people think that I'm like a, a stripper or I've been in Playboy or something. Nope. <laughs> it was based on my dog's name. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, are there any, is there any last thing that you want to leave people with? I, I'm interested. You guys should tag me on why you lack confidence because I was out for dinner with a friend the other day and she she's showed me her text and she she had responded to a friend that said, oh, I want to get dressed up and wear makeup and get really for this dinner. And then her response was, I've been hanging out with Jillian a lot and I'm really overconfident. I don't I'm not going to be putting on any makeup anymore. <laughs> so I was really interested by that. Like what why people still would feel like the yeah i, I want to know the other side of the people that don't have confidence and what it's like okay. so tag me in that okay i like i really like that and it's such a good it's such a good thing to think about flipping it well why why don't you have confidence yeah i don't understand <laughs> tell me you're great I, I get really annoyed with my friends i'm like you're beautiful and smart i don't get it <laughs> I, I, I think that begs for another another podcast episode on something like that. So yeah. I'll, I'll be pondering that now. Well, Jillian, thanks so much for being here. It was a pleasure to have you. And thanks for all of your advice and your inspiration. Well, thank you so much. And that's a wrap of another episode of Ignite Your Confidence. I'm your host, Karen Laus. Thank you so much for listening. If you love today's episode, please subscribe and leave a review. It helps other people find the podcast faster, and it certainly helps me. If you're interested in more tips and tools around confidence, please join me over in my Facebook group called Ignite Your Confidence with Karen Laus. Remember, you too can stand out with unshakable confidence. <laughs>